Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddy Network podcast. And my guest is Manuel Lima, author and uh, designer and a really creative individual who I've enjoyed uh, following, met him many years ago, but enjoyed following over the years. And he's written a new book called The, the New Designer. I think that's the name of it. And I, and I really like it. And I'm, I'm glad you're here, Manuel. And I Tell us about who you are and and then uh, how you came to write this book. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, so I, I'm a designer, but I'm also a writer. I think I was probably a writer before I was a designer. Um, I really fell in love with words and writing at a very early stage. Uh, writing for me was a way of putting my ideas into order, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of need then um, fell into design as maybe I was 16 when I became a designer. And I actually do mention this in the book uh, when I when I uh, read this book called Design uh, as Art by Bruno Munari, this Italian designer, famous Italian designer. And I knew that you know this was kind of like my calling uh, in, in many ways. Now, how I got into this book, it's kind of a fun story. This is not my first book. This is my fourth book. And it's very different from my previous ones. Uh, if if any of your listeners know my work, and as you do, uh, you can see the difference, right? My previous books are very heavy in imagery and diagrams and maps and all sorts of charts illustrations so they're really dense with imagery um there's a lot of context on the history of some of the visual metaphors that i explore either the network the tree or the circle but i felt it was time to change i felt like the period of my life of doing that type of work was kind of ending uh also because there's not that many other types of visual metaphors that uh, fascinate me as much as networks trees and, and circles so I could do a book on triangles. That was like a running joke amongst <laughs> family and friends. But I felt it was a need for something else. And I think really at the core of this book was perhaps a midlife crisis that I went through a few years back. And I, I, I actually dislike the word, the, the, no, the notion of a crisis, because I do find uh, that period that most people face around their 40s to be really enlightening because it's an opportunity for you to reflect on yourself, right? What you're doing, what you want to do, what you don't want to do more. So I think it's extremely healthy for people to go through those, those crises. For me, it was not just questioning what I was doing as a professional, but also what we were doing as a community, as a, as a practice, as a discipline, right? Design that, that is. And I, by then I'd worked at large companies like Microsoft and Google and Nokia, and also like many small startups. And it was enough for me to get a really good sense of how design is actually practiced day to day in a, a, a vast diversity of places. And I noticed that sometimes, even though we are really well-intentioned as creative professionals and, and, and designers, we don't actually deliver the type of impact we wanna see in the world. So the book started as to almost asking ourselves and asking myself, why? Why is that designers are failing to meet that uh, high aspiration that they have to have this positive impact in the world? And sometimes failing quite dramatically, right? By, by creating really bad solutions that hurt the environment and hurt society, which is in all antagonistic to their high aspiration and, and objective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how the book kind of started sort of manifesting itself this was almost yeah. four years ago but it seems to me that it's uh and i've said this to you already that it's it's a map of the design ter terrain and that for people who are not designers this is a it's kind of a, a way to walk into that world and and see a little bit of it and understand maybe not the practice of design in its kind of technical side but actually the 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 place of design in the context of society. And I think it's really, it's a really valuable um, picture for us. I, I think it's, you know, in that sense, in that sense, it's really a book of leadership. I mean, as a lead, I'm a leadership guy. And I, I, right. as I read through, I said, this is, this is how designers can lead. 
if they choose to leave, this is how they can leave. That's a good point that you mentioned is uh, about leadership, because it's true. The other day I was at a call and some of those mentioning how it is important for leaders these days to be knowledgeable about many aspects, including engineering and technology. But I, I do I would say design as well, right? Because design, again, to your point, like right, it's such an omnipresent thing. You know, we are the primary shapers of our both digital and material culture, right? It's really everyone just turn your head and you see a great variety of designed objects, right? So that element of responsibility has to be put, especially at, at the leadership level, right? Understanding what design is, you know, the impact that it can have but also how irresponsible it can be at times, right? Yeah. And I think that's goes to the, to the core of, of the book itself. The map is a great metaphor. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that you, you brought that up because of course I, I love maps. <laughs> I'm Me a too. big fan of cartography, which is perhaps to be expected given the my previous titles. But, but I think, you know, every map is always a different angle on a subject, right? And as any book, and this is a book on design, but to your point, it's not meant to be technical or talking about tools, and that's really by design. It gives you a small introduction into the design world, but almost like the challenges that you don't see, the challenges that lie behind the scenes. And I think that can actually be quite fascinating for some people to understand you know, some of the, even sometimes the internal struggles that designers go through, right, in a given context, uh, but also, again, their responsibility that they have building the things that they are building today. And this is also very urgent as a topic, because now, even though design is always eager to have a seat at the table, right now, design is responsible for creating products that are used not by thousands, not by even millions, but by billions of people. Right? right, things around Facebook and YouTube. So, all every single design choice, from the button that you do, from like that pattern, that interactive behavior that you create, matters tremendously because it's being used by, by sometimes billions of people. And it's great that if that's being used well, you know, it's in a well-intentioned matter. But at times, it can also cause addiction and all types of like mental disorders. And that's where I think we need to look carefully about what design is doing right and what if many of these tech products are causing uh to society and ultimately to the environment uh, as well so you're so you're really pointing to that there's an ethical dimension to design and and the question i have for you is where do where do we derive the ethics that we would apply to design much less something even broader as just a society at large where where do we derive those those ideas or those right. models, uh, those mindsets right. help us to think ethically when we look at the use of our design objects. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. I mean, I think ultimately, you know, we go down to, to philosophy, right? Philosophy being the source of, of most, uh, you know, ethical discussions. And I, I do remember back, back in the day when I was in college and having, you know, friends of mine who were studying law or medicine and those two fields in, in, you know, specifically are very heavy with like the ontology and ethics, right? It's really core to, to their, what they do. And for me, it always struck me as kind of hot that again, designers and, and architects, because they shape so much of what we actually create as a culture, right? We don't are, we are not lads or even concerned by any ethical dimension of, of the work that we end up doing and putting out in the world. And I think that's a, a tremendous flaw. I feel. Mm -hmm. I think the case for design is primarily, and this is one of the reasons, but primarily because we have been so long associated with art, right? Even today, many design programs are part of like an art school or an art, you know, faculty. And that association has been okay for some time, but I think it's really time for us to detach ourselves from that because that what that ends up happening is because we have still a very strong association with art, we still think of it as somehow inoffensive, right? Somehow, how can art, you know, hurt the environment or hurt, you know, society in general? It, it's all positive, right? There's no sort of um, negative effect. Uh, but also because we don't talk about not just ethics, but things that are also incredibly important for design, which is uh, psychology, cognitive science, and even ecology. So. This, these three areas, ethics, cognitive science, and ecology, 
are absent from most design programs you see out there, uh, out there today, not just even industrial design, which is concerning enough, but also digital design, interaction design, and all of those other manifestations of, of the digital. And that's usually concerning, again, because to, to what I was saying yesterday, uh, just, just now, we not only are we creating, um, you know, physical products that are landing in a landfill somewhere, but we're also creating digital products that are being used by, again, billions of people and affecting their lives in a very, very substantial way. So, so is the is the problem that we're in a, a transition that is difficult to, to go through in that for a long time, I mean, at least a century, if not longer, we have viewed design as a as a part of the function of creating consumer products and creating a consumer oriented society and that no longer really is going to be beneficial to society as a whole just to think of ourselves as consumers and instead we need to kind of think of ourselves differently and maybe this is how design ends up helping us think of ourselves differently than we've been yeah well that's actually one of the the things that i mentioned in, in chapter seven of the book which is i'm trying to deconstruct the myth that uh, design is for humans right mm -hmm. and uh and i think it goes back to what you're saying in the sense that there's actually a great quote by the researcher that i have on the book with that says that you know designers right now it most of of what we are doing is coloring between the lines of of the business model the grid our grid the design grid has become the business model, right? right? That's really the only thing that matters at the end of the day. But in all honesty, I think focusing primarily on our, on our human stakeholders is probably not the best way to go because we keep on doing this mistake on and on and on. But again, that human stakeholder, that human customer or user is only a transient user of that design solution. Right. Eventually, that product will land up somewhere else right in the landfill somewhere or just deteriorated and stay in the environment for you know sometimes thousands and thousands of years so we have to think about planet earth as the ultimate stakeholder of every design solution we put out every single one of them that's the ultimate stakeholder anything else that we do is just ecologically irresponsible there's just no other way to to go around it so is there a way of thinking about this that we want to create design objects that have a multi-generational lifespan is that absolutely. a way of looking at that absolutely it's it's like the seven generation principle right mm -hmm. uh, very few in, in a lot of like indigenous cultures is the notion that whatever you do right you have to do something it has to benefit not just your generation but several generations down below right right so and again, that's a beautiful sort of idea and concept, right? Elongating the present time, right? This idea of like the long now, which I love also like behind the, the, the notion of the long now foundation, right? right? It's really expanding the present time so that you actually consider that the repercussions of your work, not just affecting the immediate, the now, the present, which is very human of us. We are very focused only solely on the present, right? Uh, it's a very sort of human bias we have, the presentism bias. But really extending, elongating this present to becoming this long now and caring deeply about what's going to happen to future generations. And if only we were to think in those terms, I mean, it would be so much better in everything we do as, as designers and architects, as you know, primary shapers of our material culture. So I want to I want to um, go back a decade or more to your first book, Visual Complexity. Yeah, and um, it's a fantastic book, and that's where I met you when you gave a, a presentation right. on that. And you know, I was I, I really was so into that, and it's really been a one of those moments of clarity for me ever since. So networks are important. So here here's what I'd like to maybe propose or uh, present to you. How do how do people who are not connected to design, other than as consumers, but are really not connected to it in the sense of appreciating or understanding it, develop the the network they needed they need to understand that? So what what I'm really saying, how do designers 
develop networks with the people who ultimately are the beneficiaries and the ones who will be responsible for taking their design objects and using them and then figuring out what to do with them when it's done. How do, how do we build a kind of a society of, uh, that's networked around design so that we mm. can uh, having this conversation, not with designers over here and everybody else over here, but where we're all right. talking together. That's a good point. I mean, I think it starts with, with sharing, with information, with, with transparency, with awareness, uh, all those things really important for like those, those gaps to be some fields, you know, over time. And, and the two areas of like consumers and designers to be kind of like, you know, closer together. But going back to, to the notion of networks and, and specifically the notion of systems, which are very much, you know, around complexity theory and, and, and networks, designers surprisingly are very unaware of, of systems theory and, and, and complexity and networks for the most part. And I think that's a huge gap. Again, similar to, to ethics, psychology and ecology, systems theory could be something that could should also be thought in design schools because again the repercussions of what they do right from a systemic point of view are remarkable right everything the designer makes here and this is actually i tackle this in a chapter called design is not local right and i, I i'm very clear the design is not local anymore it has never been local because whatever you do in a place in the world it will have repercussions somewhere else right but even the way that designers think about systems, it's so at such a small scale that is quite uh, regretful, I think, because we do use the word system quite often, but we use it in a sense of a design system. And what is a design system? It's basically a collection of patterns, of components, you know, scroll bars, buttons, boxes, just the styling of those little pieces that make a user interface. That's what normally we call a design system. And when we think, when we say a designer thinks systemically, we are mostly talking about consistency, right? Thinking about how this part of the, of the digital product connects to this one, how everything is happens in a very cohesive way. But again, look at that scale, you know, such a small, small scale. And I think design is really lacking ambition because the ultimate and most interesting system we have is planet Earth. And that's the canvas where design should be operating on. Not just the tiny, tiny screen that we have on a mobile phone, but the entire planet. The entire planet has become a design space and we should you know, embrace it and understand again, how ecosystems play a role, how everything is interconnected and, and what is your role in this vast web of, of nodes, right? And and how can you contribute to it in a positive and also sometimes in a negative way? In your book, you, you mentioned this idea about the generalist and the importance mm -hmm. of these people. Um, you know, uh, there was a book that mm -hmm. um, Kenneth Michelson and, and Richard Martin wrote called The Neo-Generalist, which is captures this. And then there's there are people, there are groups out there of um, polymaths that are gathering and, yeah. and talking. And, and and what I'm wondering is whether the kind of the push for specialization in in business has caused uh, designers to be treated as specialists rather than generalists. And that, mm -hmm. that the more they're, they're, they see themselves as generalists, the wider impact that they can have upon all these things that they're designing, but also the world in which receives them and, and uh, interfaces with that. So what do you think of that? Oh, I, I think there's a, a hidden force at play right now, which is very much forcing a large amount of the design community to be specialists and to think only about tools and 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 thinking about design as as production, right? And and I don't think design is about production. And I, I I I'm very against that notion. But it is the the that hidden force that's creating programs that are sometimes just weeks long, right? Three weeks, four weeks, you become a designer. You can go out in the world, and the only thing you really learn is how to play with a given tool. And looking at design as 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 a production line of putting things out there into the world without any sort of thinking about critical thinking, 
how this plays a role in again in society and in the environment. But it's really at your point, this notion of human beings being machines, highly specialized machines and automons, mm -hmm. right? And design is just one of many areas where we see this happening. And I think there's a little bit of push against this across society, not just in design in many areas and realizing the benefit of having generalists that actually know a little bit of everything and can actually create the links between those fields. Yeah. And I think that's the key advantage of generalists is that by knowing a little bit of, of everything, that's how new ideas start forming because you can make those connections in a way that a specialist can never make them because they are just too focused on that little, you know, that little silo. Well, that really uh, comes back to the need for for us to be networked together and and not to be treated in these enclaves of, oh, they're the designers over here and they're the users over here. Oh, absolutely. We, we really need to be uh, in conversation with each other. We need network. We need to support each other. We need to be talking about um, the things that matter to us. And and I think we need to be influencing each other. And I think that's the kind of impact that you're you're suggesting in your book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I see this all the time, you know, this silo is being created between, let's say, designers and, and scientists as a you know, great example. Normally in my in my you know, field of passion, data visualization, you see this all the time where scientists have a lot of really interesting data and are eager for someone to like look at this and, and you know, from a different angle, from a visualization angle. And normally you have the opposite side, which is like a lot of designers and data visualization specialists being eager for some work, some some data, like having a lot of skill and a lot, of, a lot of talent, but lacking meaningful data sources to work with that, you know, are uh, adding that positive impact that they so much desire. So making those groups talk to each other, influence each other, right, benefit and collaborate between themselves would be hugely beneficial. And, and, I, and that's really my hope for the university, the teaching methods of, of the next decades to come is not so much following this like highly specialized uh, track because again we also going to be facing new forces like uh, artificial intelligence and the the highly specialized route I don't think it's the right one for humankind in in the coming years I think really embracing the the, the benefit of 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 generalists right people that really know a little bit of everything and can make those connections meaningfully I think that's a much powerful tool. And, and I actually say to that extent that I'm normally a designer that hates design books, I guess, apart from my own. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I do do not, I mean, I have quite a lot of books. I, I see you have plenty of books as well, Ed, but yeah. I, I don't have that many design books. And because I, I feel like I get inspired and I benefit so much more from other parallel uh, and sometimes completely disparate uh, oh, topics. Yeah. And it's much more enriching for me uh, as an individual as well. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. I, I like design books because I like, because to me they're, um, uh, they tell me how this designer thinks. Right. And that to me is fascinating, and I want to, and then that makes me want to have a conversation with them, like yes. have them on, you know, have them on a podcast where we can have, we can talk like this. And yes. So, but it's the notion. It's the notion that imagine if all that library behind you would be on one single topic, right? It's oh, yeah. the notion of like being part of like a monoculture that frightens me, like an echo chamber. Like you only you you know very much about that topic, but that's the only thing you know, right? It's that monoculture well, that really scares you. Can me. see three or maybe four of these bookcases here. Um, there's another. There's another one here, and then there's four more upstairs so it's, oh my god so and, and to me I, I say this is the way i would describe it so every one of those books was written with a design idea in mind mm -hmm. and 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 i have bought books that i had no reason to buy other than i liked the way it was constructed i liked the way the typeface looked i liked the way it was printed and and i just and i admire the beauty of it the object itself yeah absolutely. the object itself and then yeah. uh you know i there's a a book over there of a, a renaissance italian philosopher i don't know who he is you know but i saw it in a bookstore in denver and i said oh that is gorgeous i'm gonna buy that book you know and i haven't read it yet but 
someday I will someday when I have an hour that I want to kill and it draws me to it and I think right. that's part of what that's the beauty of design is that it draws you to and it engages you in something that is really of, um, of beauty and um, it can be and it's more right. it is beauty bigger than simply oh this is a work of art this is beauty as something that contributes to the quality of our lives and the quality of the society we live in. Of course, and that's huge. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I'm fascinated by books, of course, as well. But and and, and you're so right. I think some books you just like you want to. They are a little bit of of art, you know. It's like you want to take care of them. You you know you want to hold them, you know, preciously in your hands. And there's something about the smell, the unfolding, the yeah. Also, the perspective of knowledge, even if you haven't read something, you know, it's that you know that they, this information is always there, and you are just accumulating that. And I and I, and so what I would suggest is for people that the next book you buy is the New Designer, because I think you will find that all of that we which we have talked today is is right there, and it will it will open up your perception of what design is about, but it also make you I think realize that there are people out there that are worth knowing because their their creativity is on display when they design something and that's worth um engaging in and appreciating it and and uh celebrating so so manuel thank you for being here thank you. uh thank you so much, i look forward to having another conversation with you sometime in the future i think there's more there's more in here that we we can talk <laughs> about and um and maybe you can uh, maybe you can connect me connect me with some designers that we, we should I should be interviewing. Oh, I'm sure. Of celebrating course. their work too. So absolutely, that would be great. That would be great. So thank you for coming on. Thank, thank you. you, everybody, Thanks, for everybody. watching. And uh, please uh, subscribe and hit the like button. But even more so, please offer your comments and your questions so that we can be in conversation with you. Because after all, that's really why I'm doing this to have conversations with people like Manuel and, and people like you. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on the Eddie Network podcast. Bye-bye.